for me. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first panel of the day. As Marcel already mentioned, we are going to discuss uh, the Mika. Is it an underestimated chance for Europe? And recently, the market was characterized by the bulls again. We've seen new all-time highs. In January, the SEC approved 11 Bitcoin ETFs, which might be one driver for the new all-time highs. Um, however, the rally is probably not over. We also have, in a few days, the Bitcoin halving coming up, the fourth, reducing the block reward to 3.125 Bitcoin, which historically has been linked to price action. So ultimately, there might be another hidden chance for the market, which is the Mika. This year, it will finalize and kick into effect. Therefore, in our panel today, we're going to discuss how Europe can benefit from it and whether it's an underestimated factor for the whole crypto asset market. We have a very good panel, good composition. We have uh, participants from the market side. We have participants that are more focused on the regulation. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, maybe let's start off with a statement from each of you. Um, Internet, cloud and AI were primarily developed on other continents. Uh, are crypto assets a tech opportunity for Europe? What's your opinion? Feel free to start in whatever direction. Maybe I can, I can take this, this first question. First of all, great to be here. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, and and I, I think we have a, a great panel, <clears throat> excuse me, today. Um, I think we do have, or, or let's say we, we've started the right way. There's a great, let's say, graveyard that we now need to invest in and to keep on working on. Uh, Europe um, is a known region where um, it's a known region for not being the first in many things, right? Uh, let's be let's be honest, and and you'll hear me saying, you know, on this narrative over and over again. However, I think we've been soon enough to to basically have a good a good graveyard to then develop on top of that. So I think it's a good start, but we cannot sleep on it, right? Especially on on how not only we evolve the, the regulation coming, there are people already talking about MICA 2.0, right? Which is, which is funny. Um, and I think it's also needed, uh, but it's also about how are we going to enforce, how are institutions, companies going to work with their regulators in the different countries? Um, so, yeah, I would say it's a good start, but we shouldn't sleep. Fair point, yeah. It's a good starting point. I, I, I can give it a... I, I mean, I, I work for, obviously, a very large um, US firm, right? And so, um, and so we have this kind of um, outsider's perspective somewhat. Well, I'm European, um, obviously, name is Portuguese, but um, I work for an American firm, and so... I think it's been actually evident, and it's, it's, it's the one thing that I kind of disagree about the, the question there is that I don't think the chance is underestimated. Actually, I think there's a lot of people across the world in global businesses looking at Mika and realizing that actually it's the, you know, it's really the first robust um, regulatory approach that we have in any sort of the, the major markets in the world. Um, there's certainly been other approaches in smaller economies, but not in, in this kind of block um, of which there are only really three in the world, right, with, with the kind of size that we've got in Europe. And so I, I think it's certainly a chance. And I think to, to your question, I, I think it's, it's right that the internet and, and AI and others have been sort of developed in other parts of the world. I think crypto for many different reasons, whether they're regulatory or uh, political, whatever it might be, um, actually hasn't, right? And so... Um, and so I think there is a chance here for Europe to, to take the first step forward. And, and I think it has, right? The, these regulatory frameworks take years to develop, as we know. It certainly takes years to develop uh, across 27 different countries and, and getting it through the various stages of approval. So I think Europe has a huge head start already. Um, I agree with Joaquin that we can't sort of be asleep at the steering wheel, but, but I think the, we, we've taken the chance already. It's about consistently kind of moving it forward. Yeah, maybe just to uh, add from my side, so I, I think it's a great achievement of the European institutions to have uh, introduced such a regulatory framework which provides 
at least some kind of certainty for crypto assets and services provided for crypto assets, but it is uh, only a first step because there are many challenges and uh, still open questions. But um, from my perspective, also in international context, there is a large interest uh, in our regulatory framework, which will become applicable here in Europe. And as Jan said in its presentation, here is uh, indeed a large market opportunity and um, it is really great to see that um, the European institutions uh, identified uh, DLT or blockchain as potential new technology for which it uh, yeah, would be useful to introduce such a regulatory framework. Yeah, m maybe, maybe to add, and I'm not contradicting anyone uh, here, but um, I think we all know there's more than regulation to um, actually of for market to, to develop, right? Um, so the regulation is the necessary condition, but it's not the only one. Um, and we also need to make sure that, you know, we actually develop the um, relevant market infrastructure for that, that we have sufficient funding for all the players who want to uh, be active in that field. Um, and that's also something um, I think we all know if the US, for instance, uh, gets really serious, then they will be you know, they will outplay us very easily. So, yeah, let's, um, as you said, um, let's not rest on what we have achieved, but uh, make sure to actually further develop this. Definitely money is needed for development, right? Let's don't forget that. Um, we're not the best at, at financing either in, in, in the region, I would say. Absolutely. I think that's also a good segue into a question that is proposed quite often. Um, how big is the threat of, for example, the US just implementing Mika and copy-paste it and do a little few tweaks and, yeah, basically save the time, right? So with the first mover, first mover always comes with potential disadvantages of people just copying it outright. Uh, what's your stance on that? So maybe just from a regulatory perspective, so it is, uh, I think it, it would not be the worst case because um, indeed the market is uh, discussing for standardization and as we see for other regulatory frameworks in particular for financial market infrastructure, so it is always good to have some kind of international agreed principles applicable and therefore it would make uh, potentially sense uh, for providing services um, also cross-border. So. Yeah, just to, to add to that one, I mean, uh, would be brilliant if our regulatory approach and framework kind of is promoted globally, right? I mean, this would really help also European-based uh, uh, providers to easily expand globally and uh, kind of reuse existing process, procedures, etc. So I would really, uh, I, I would not see it as a threat, but more as an opportunity for global expansion. So. I would say that one of the key things of this industry is basically interoperability across not only blockchains, but ultimately what we're doing in many use cases with, with blockchain is moving value in different ways. It might be by tokenization of real world assets, pure crypto, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this will, if, if the market pushes hard enough, this will, this, will, this will basically force policymakers to have some kind of standards for basically, to, to have basically the basics, right? Uh, we are seeing that with, travel, with the travel rule, with different standards, uh, with different like, yeah, messaging standards around different travel rule types, etc. I think that's a good first step. We'll see if, if that continues across the entire world, right? Probably Europe and the US will talk to each other and ultimately will find a, a, a way to work together. So I, I would see more than threats, I would see more opportunities on that side. But that also, as um, I always try to see both, both sides of the picture, that can be also a risk of not, not executing on it, right? But, I wouldn't see it as an actual competition. Valid point, valid point. Um, let's maybe flip the side a little bit. What, what are the critical parts about it? For example, one topic that I also believe in a little bit is um, until we have a CBDC, there is some limits on the traction that we can actually achieve by the Mika. It's nice that we have the regulation, but it's also just the first step if we can't use it as it's intended. Any opinions on that? 
Yeah, I, I guess we are all longing for a CBDC in many areas. Um, unfortunately, it's not there yet. Um, and it's also not to come for probably the next five to 10 years, at least, you know, for, for, for retail use. Um, so, uh, you know, what are the options? I mean, the only option really was to actually start with the regulation now and then hope for the CPTC to be introduced as quickly as possible. But yeah, agree, it's part of the whole infrastructure that we do need a CBDC, among other things. I, I, I have a mixed opinion on that. I think, it, I think the answer depends. Um, so the C, I don't think a CBDC is necessarily a, a silver bullet for everything. It certainly, it certainly would be a huge development for wholesale use cases, right? And so at, at the institutional level, um, it, it, it obviously would decrease uh, a number of risks, um, it, it would increase speed of settlement, et cetera, at a wholesale level. If you think about sort of more uh, retail and sort of smaller corporate use cases, actually there's already digital forms of money and they're already pretty significant um, and Mika does address um, that part of the market um, pretty significantly and so I actually think that it does open up um, a number of use cases even with the forms of digital money that we have, that we have today and so, so I think there's kind of you you can allow the system to to flourish under the current regulation, even if there are some some use cases that can be that, that probably would need a CBDC and, and and might need to wait a little bit longer. Um, but but I I think you know what we've seen with more of the crypto asset side of the market is that there's a huge amount of value in just sort of more retail type use cases. Um, it may be you know uh, uh, so far they've they've developed in. So developing markets, et cetera, where there's, where there's more of a need for that kind of digital exchange of value, but we've certainly seen that move um, into, into developed markets as well. So I, so I think Mika will already provide a pretty big chance um, of some of those smaller use cases to develop organically, um, and then hopefully the institutional sort of infrastructure catches up a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a picture that we see all over the place, that retail is a little quicker to adopt, less regulation. They also usually don't care if, whether it's a privately issued stablecoin or if it's a regulated one. It does the job, but on the corporate side of things, I believe uh, a lot of corporations do uh, want the CBDC to be in regulated uh, spaces and, and just be on the safe side. Um, so the question is, is there maybe an alternative to that? For example, uh, e-money tokens that a few banks would issue. Would that be an alternative to having a CBDC, which, as you've mentioned, is going to take a few more years? Yeah. I, I mean, let, let's be honest. Micah is addressing the money side. I mean, it provides the framework for stable coins. There is a huge coordination problem probably uh, introduced by Micah on the money side as there will be competition of different forms of stable coins and we, uh, there, there's good arguments to have uh, some uniformity of money. <laughs> there are clear advantages of that. However, uh, at least Micah, uh, from a regulatory point of view and the institutions in the EU kind of not just only looked at the asset side, um, they also looked into the money side. And I mean, if you want to build a fully regulated smart contract based uh, trading venue for crypto assets and you want to set in stable coins, Micah, I mean, you have to discuss with the regulator, but uh, in general, Micah would allow this. So uh, we, uh, and the stable coin uh, that most likely will not, oh, oh, sorry, uh, a digital euro on the retail side that most likely will not be tokenized and live on uh, DLT infrastructures, most likely would not even be the best suitable form of money maybe to kind of facilitate mica based services. So I would, yeah, I, I see a clear demand for, uh, for uh, digital forms of money, uh, sovereign and private, uh, but I would really say that at least in this point, there are other points, but mica kind of uh, took the right perspective and was uh, also addressed the money side in the right way. Just to give a very quick, um, to, to add to that uh, and give a, a little bit of factual market color of what we're actually seeing in the market right now. Since interest rates uh, went up already a year, a year and a half ago, maybe, um, 
We are seeing more and more interest from traditional financial institutions and also new, newly created companies to create the stable coins either for specific use cases or for broad, broader use cases. This, in my opinion, has two main components. The reason behind, behind this are one, there's a real business case and you know money generating case i mean they issue the stable coin they put those funds to work in the least risk uh, money market funds they can find and you're already making a four percent on that sitting on it right um i mean who who wouldn't want to do that right with 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 that money on top of that, the reason why they're really doing it now, apart from the, the success that we've seen in, in the different stable coins like the USDCs and et cetera, et cetera, around the world, um, USDT, et cetera, it's because they're starting to see real use cases, right? Like it's easy to implement, more or less. Um, they talk to five to 10 uh, serious exchanges out there. And there you go. You have a stable coin to go in and out of crypto or in and out of whatever asset you want to, if it's listed in these exchanges, without really having to then move your money into the bank account, et cetera, which is something we haven't resolved yet, right? So I think you don't have to be Einstein here to understand the use case and to build this, this, this type of, of product. And again, um, from a market color perspective, I've seen... Um, I joined Borchester Cardinal only four months ago. I've already seen three projects pass through my desk. And uh, before when I was at BitGo, where I spent four and a half years running EMEA and LATAM, I think I, I, I saw 12 to 15 of these projects. So I think we, we should keep a, a close eye to, to this. And also the ECB, of course. I can just confirm that from, uh, let's say, uh, highly funded Series A startups with like a two-digit million pre-funding all the way down to highly regulated banks and institutions. We have been approached from various market participants on the opportunity of issuing in stablecoin, actually. So it's, uh, yeah, I can just confirm what you say. Our desk was also quite full with those. But yeah, uh, as I said before, uh, there are some let's say, critical components also to bring a, uh, a stablecoin into scaling. And I would say that uh, not all of those cases kind of were thought through to the very end and really saw the kind of necessity to really have use cases underpinning your stablecoin uh, because nobody will use your non-interest-bearing form of money if there are interest-bearing forms of money out there that do the same, right? Now you've mentioned there's a multitude of stablecoin projects popping up. Isn't that introducing potential uh, problems as well? Because then people have to agree on which one to use, which one is accepted, or do we just accept all of them? What's your stance on that? Maybe I can take this one at first. So uh, that is similar to what we see, uh, for example, on the DLT pilot regime. So it is opening for new market entries, or so providing opportunities to develop and. Uh, um, uh, provide new innovations uh, for specific services, and that is what we see here. So for the means of payment with uh, stable coins, uh, for example. But then uh, there's some kind of risk um, for fragmentation in the market. But uh, what we already heard, so uh, if there is uh, some kind of need or providing interoperability, so that would not be some kind of challenging. So I can make use of different um, stable coins. Like I do also have different type of securities in my security account and in my wallet. So. It is only some kind of how to bring technical systems uh, into interoperability to work together, and that is also some kind of challenging for, uh, but also an opportunity for regulated financial institutions to working together uh, in providing services for crypto assets, so they can work from a technological perspective uh, with fintechs and startups, uh, which really have expertise uh, in, in what they're doing, and uh, therefore it could be uh, used. And actually, there is at least from traditional market players no alternative provided when it comes to a means of payment which is already on chain. I would, so we also run a huge uh, retail broker, very big here in, in, in Germany and the DAC region, Bison. Most of you probably probably uh, have, have uh, heard about it. 
so for for us right now, what we're seeing is that it's, it's basically a business and market race, right? We get approached by these players that, of course, need to comply with all the standards and they all, of course, we wouldn't even look at them if they don't, right? But once they pass that filter, it's, of course, a necessary condition, like, like in many cases, but uh, it, it, it's not everything. Once they pass that, it's literally a race on um, how they can convince the exchange or the brokerage platform, etc., that they are better than the others. And that might be a commercial discussion in many cases, okay? Let's don't forget, we are all here in one way or the other to build businesses that are also fruitful and that can make money at least in the long term, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's very important in those conversations, right? Um, how are you going to convince your your LPs or your exchanges, wherever, when, you know, whatever platform you have as a means of exchange with your clients to, to be the first and not the fifth stable coin. And probably these platforms will not uh, have seven or ten, right? Maybe they would have one, two, maybe maximum three if it makes sense, but not more. So it's a pure business competition right now. I think it, it probably, to, to add to what, you, to what you said, Joaquin, it's, it's, it's really about liquidity, right? And so you're still, because the digital asset market is still deprived of fiat liquidity underpinning it, right? And so the hence you get into this race of where actually you do have competing stable coins, but ultimately you probably wouldn't have to, right? If you think about commercial bank money, which is the equivalent that we've got today, if, if you're a bank, then yes, you look at your correspondent banks differently and you credit rate them, et cetera, but as a consumer, you don't really care what kind of commercial bank money you're holding in your account, right? You, you consider that fungible with others. So, so I think there's a, a end state where you have a number of stable coins, all of which have wet, widespread liquidity, um, in which case then actually from a consumer standpoint or a sort of small corporate standpoint, you probably don't care as much. But we're still in a place where there is that race to try and make sure that you know, the, you become one of those stable coins with enough liquidity that people don't care, right? Um, and a lot of that is going to US dollar, by the way. I think the euro is a little bit behind in terms of liquidity. If the US dollar is already not, the US dollar one's already not very liquid um, for, for large use cases, the euro is, is where actually Europe has quite a lot of, of work to do in making sure that there is sufficient liquidity and sufficient sort of on-ramps and off-ramps in, into the market. Absolutely. Yeah, in the end, we're all in the business of making money, so there will be some competition on that. Um, speaking about money, um, the costs for compliance and licenses are expensive. <laughs> will this lead to centralization since only large corporations can afford them? Maybe a, a question to Stefan and Christina looking at the regulation focused people. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I guess we can agree, agree Stefan, that um, it will cost money, obviously. Um, licensing um, procedures are, are expensive uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that also brings us back to the funding issue, which we discussed uh, at the very beginning, that, yeah, money is needed in order to develop this ecosystem and to develop an infrastructure and to actually have significant market players. Um, on the other hand, it's also, we, we, we are not talking about, you know, billions here either. Uh, I think even the the European market will be able to fund a few players uh, to apply for licenses, um, but in the end, um, you know, with, with any market, there will be there will be consolidation, and you know, hopefully, not like 200 uh, different uh, providers that actually all offer the same service. Um, but yeah, they, they, they will, it will um, hopefully reduce at some point in time to to a lower number of of players who are actually offering meaningful services yeah 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 i can just uh, yeah complement to that so i would assume so what we see actually also i'm um, referring to the title so um, as large regulated entities uh, also make use of um, such service providers so there are uh, many intermediaries uh, involved in providing for example um, these uh, funds or uh, etp products because um, all the things around the crypto asset as an underlying or as an asset reference, uh, as a referenced asset used for stable coins, so that requires already some service providers, and therefore, I guess, 
um, as, as Jens said, so any institution would um, have a close look to the market and, and define its strategy, so how to deploy or, or develop such solutions internally as an own system or to make use of a service provider, and therefore I think it would make sense, and at least uh, from our side when it comes, for example, to cost for authorization, so that is mainly driven by the time needed uh, of the colleagues within Buffin and, and this um, yeah, it's common standard uh, actually for, for all types of authorization or supervisory measures. I would say so. Um, definitely, compliance um, is a big bucket of money that you have to spend to build re regulated businesses. The main challenge, I would say, is not actually building the processes and, and this stuff, especially for traditional financial entities, but mostly the um, uh, regulatory capital that you require if you're doing different businesses, right? Like, I've seen races in a series Bs and Cs of companies raising money only to comply with their regulatory capital. That's crazy, I would say, right? So. I mean, nothing against anyone, okay, okay, but, and of course, it's to protect final uh, customers. It's not that I am against it whatsoever, but, you know, doing a race only to comply with that, you know, maybe it's not the best case scenario for a company to really grow. Having that said, I, I don't think complying with the regulation is, will be the main driver for um, um, consolidation of the market. Um, our thesis is that, you know, the financial industry universe is already too big to allow dozens of crypto native companies basically eat mo most of the, at least the infrastructure business, right? And here I'm talking about, you know, um, brokerage, custody, et cetera, et cetera, at an institutional level. I think the consolidation will come from big TradFi institutions buying great infrastructure businesses in some form or kind. Maybe a few of them will IPO, et cetera, like a Coinbase of the world, but I don't think too many will do that because let's remember infrastructure where you have to uh, basically be complying with these huge um, um, regulations. Um, it's a business where Trotfies have been for a hundred years at least already, right? So I think it's a little bit naive to think that, uh, you know, only because you have to comply with regulation, um, there's a lot of uh, small crypto startups and businesses will die. That will be one more uh, thing that will add to the entire, um, uh, let's say, world of other challenges that these companies will have, right? Yeah, needing to maybe just to, to add one point because that is uh, indeed from my perspective really important. So uh, it is often referred to Mika as providing legal certainty. Yes, indeed it does, but only for provisioning of regulated services. So there's uh, some uh, supervision introduced and there's an authorization requirement. But what remains and that is really comes with compliance uh, also under Mika as regulated uh, entities is that there remains risk of uncertainty of the legal nature of specific crypto assets. And therefore, compliance is really important uh, also for the institution itself because it requires risk management and really look uh, into the details uh, of crypto assets and the service provider to really ensure and, and, and identify what, uh, what risk remains because um, what after Mika remains is some kind of uncertainty and fragmentation also among member states on the legal nature of crypto assets, so speaking in terms of civil and private law. And therefore, it really makes sense to have some kind of compliance or risk governance in an institution to ensure risk management of, of these new type of instruments. Thank you. And maybe to just add to that one, I think, as you just said, Michael creates a single European market for crypto assets and crypto asset related services with all the uncertainty on the national level in civil law and other fields but it also there, there also will be a race for authorizations under MICA and I'm really hoping that this level playing field will also kind of be maintained by the national competent authorities among Europe right I mean we it's a single market services are passportable you know and if and I, I'm very 
uh, I'm very optimistic and positive that this kind of fair game will be maintained through joint supervisory teams, et cetera, et cetera, and over, overlooking by the ECB and others. But we also have to make sure that yeah, the standards that you need to fulfill to, to get a Mika authorization are really kind of comparable among the European member states and that there's no simple fast track to Mika by just going into some jurisdiction, right? Yeah, I really like the point about reducing uncertainty. I believe that's also a big factor in, in people being hesitant to explore options in the crypto scene because it's uncertain whether or not it will still be legal. Can we actually do it? Uh, but looking at time, let's maybe uh, look into the future a little bit. Um, I believe we have four minutes or five minutes left, so about a minute each. Um, where do you see the European crypto asset market in five years and maybe what are the hurdles and challenges um, to achieve that implementation? Because you know you want to start. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the hurdle just picking up what has already been said, you know, there are still some, um, you know, some, well, not inconsistencies, but uh, Mika could still uh, use clarification uh, in some uh, in some points, uh, you know, what about uh, lending and staking, for instance? Uh, what about a uniform uh, insolvency regime and all that? So clearly, there is uh, there's room of improvement. I'm I'm not talking about Mika 2.0 yet, but uh, clearly, as with any EU regulation, that's gonna not you know that won't be the last uh, the last version that we see of it. Uh, where, where where do the European crypto markets uh, stand in five years' time? I uh, Obviously, uh, don't know, but um, I mean, given the you know the the, the overall predictions that it's uh, the market is still growing, uh, Mika hopefully will uh, will enable the the European market to actually um, uh, you know get a substantial share in this in this growing uh, market. Maybe three points from my side. First, I think we will see a further professionalization of market. What is positive? We will see more and more traditional financial institutions moving into the market. <clears throat> and um, I'm really hoping that we will see some strong European-based stablecoins that will facilitate the crypto ecosystem in Europe. I, I was actually speaking with a policymaker from the European Banking Authority in Paris last week. And I asked this exact question, what about MICA 2.0, right? Like, what about DeFi? What about NFTs? Lending and borrowing, which is a huge topic in terms of how you can collateralize debt with, with crypto or with digital assets that can be actually executed in a matter of seconds. That is a huge advantage of, of blockchain. And he did assure me that they are already... Uh, basically doing the, the consultations and the drafts for what's next. So all these things were left out on purpose. Um, but I think in five years' time is, is enough time to have this MICA 2.0, right? And then uh, another thing I would say, we, we will go through an adjustment period where not only the companies that want to be hyper-regulated and com comply um, will adjust to what the um, um, uh, the regulators ask them to do. Okay, let's remember that MICA is a European um, standard, but also then it has to be enforced by, by local um, uh, regulators. So there's an adjustment period there, which we'll see how it goes. Hopefully there's nothing, you know, there's no big, big red flags in any country and we can all continue trusting um, the, the ecosystem, but also the regulator will have to adjust to how companies do things and see this, right? The same way they adjusted to MIFID implementation, right? Banks took three more years than that they should, and this is just how it went, right? Uh, the top five banks in every country took three times more of the time to implement it, right? So maybe I, th I think we're going to see something similar. Um, so I don't want to repeat what everybody said because I, I agree with all of it. Um, so, so I'll answer a different question, which is, what about in 10 years? And where, where I hope we are in 10 years is that we're no longer talking about a crypto asset market. I think we're just talking about the market, right? And I think Mika is the first step towards that. I think all these other steps, you know, I, I hope in 10 years we're talking about, back talking about um, capital markets union and, and sort of broader macro themes. And I think this is a first step that allows the technology infrastructure to come to that space 
and that allows us sort of more overall more efficient market infrastructure across Europe. Yeah, maybe just uh, as an introductory remark, so I fully agree to what Christina said from a legal perspective. So what we have seen in European regulations is that there's some kind of a review period where there are amendments proposed if needed. And therefore I would take um, what Joe Keener uh, said. So um, I would also have some kind of so personal speaking a vision of um, that markets become, or that there's a strong effort to bring blockchain and DLT system not only for crypto assets, but uh, to see it as an infrastructure layer where different types of instrument as a digital object can interact together and, and therefore I would really see that it is some kind of ongoing effort uh, in the market for traditional players and, and new market entries to really provide different services uh, and um, develop new solutions on top of an infrastructure layer and also from a supervisory perspective um, uh, we already have some kind of talks uh, with different firms and solution providers that also the Technologic, uh, technological underlying infrastructure also provides new tools for supervisors to ensure, for example, market abuse uh, regulation or, or market surveillance. And therefore, I think it, it really is um, a great chance to see what um, the underlying infrastructure can provide and how institutions can compete on top with different types of instruments. Given that Marcel is already standing, I take it I should gotta keep it quick. Um, thank you all for the discussion. It was a very lively discussion. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I believe we have a positive and bright future ahead. I believe we all agree it's, it's a good thing that we have Mika. There's still work to be done, but it's a step in the right direction. So thank you all for participating and thank you for paying attention. <laughs>